So good day, everyone. My name is Brian Prophet with the Open Source Program Office here at Red Hat, welcoming you to another edition of Community Central. Before I introduce today's guests, I'd like to do the usual housekeeping notes. As always, this is a participatory um, session. Definitely get your questions and into the Q&A tool that is located on the right side of your screen within BlueJeans. We will ask our guests uh, those questions based on votes at the end of his presentation uh, later in this hour. So housekeeping out of the way, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Rudolph Pina Nair um, from the Boston Children's Hospital, who will be talking to us about Project Chris, which is a fascinating uh, intersection between data and technology and open source and medical uh, technology. So, uh, Rudolph, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, good morning. Thanks, Brian. Um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Um, and I'm very happy to be here and talk about a project that has sort of been near and dear to um, certainly the hearts of a couple folks here at Boston Children's and in the larger community around, around this area. Um, so, without further ado, welcome. Um, about me, so um, I work at Boston Children's. I um, have a, a PhD in biomedical engineering, and I deal with image processing kind of problems. Um, for the most part, I did research back in the day, um, but these days I've shifted much more to kind of development work. And there's a picture of me, so you can see what I look like. This was in the before times, uh, when we still were doing stuff like running races and stuff, and stuff like that, which don't seem to be the case these days. But anyway, hopefully things will go back to normal at some point in the future. Um, all right, so, so who are we? So we're a group, um, the Advanced Computing Group, within a mouthful, the Fetal Neonatal Neuroimaging and Development Science Center at Boston Children's Hospital. And as, as a um, computing group, we focus a bit more on the D side of computational R&D. Um, we look at computational platforms, workflow development, somehow deploying existing compute, and also some new de novo research solutions. Um, but our, our, our scope, certainly in the context of this talk, is very much how do we get good solutions um, out from the lab and into the clinical uh, front lines? You know, so, so why do we do all of this stuff? Well, as I'm sure most people would agree with, no matter how cool anything is that we develop computationally, if it doesn't get out there to people to use, it's gonna have very little impact. You know, I've, I've seen so many research projects, so many computational solutions that are so amazingly transformative, but they languish in a lab, they never get outside a postdoc's hands, they live in a MATLAB script, and for all of their amazingness, they just kind of wither on the vine. So we try to solve that problem in some way. How do we get researchers in this field, and other developers, to be honest, um, to get their work to as large an effective audience of users as possible. And in, in definitely, we want to focus on a, a simple and effective way as possible. And I mean simple here from the perspective of a developer. Um, so, because we want, as researchers and developers, we want to focus on the problem, not the infrastructure, not the, the management of data necessarily, we just want to get our problems um, out there, or our solutions, I should say. So there's this little law in, um, in human computer interaction called Tesla's law, which you may or may not know about, but it's a kind of nifty little idea, right? It's the conservation of complexity. You cannot make a complex, simple, a system simple just by virtue of wanting it to be so. Complexity always lurks. You can just move it around between the user, uh, between the application developer, and between the platform developer. Um, and oftentimes, as developers in this medical computing, we leave the complexity way too much in the, on the, ends, in the hands of the user, um, which means we assume users are as proficient as we are in being in a Linux terminal and getting their data and being in a command line. These assumptions don't hold in the larger um, realm of kind of clinical or uh, medical work. So what have we done? Well, we've, we have this kind of platform as a service solution, um, which we've been developing for a couple of years with a lot of collaboration from Red Hat over the last two years called Chris. It's completely open source. It's fully con containerized. Oops. And um, it, we have these change, chains of containerized compute that we can stream together in the platform. 
you can have this running on premise. You can have this running, quote unquote, on the cloud, you know, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, but that's what we've tried to do. And we've tried to make all of this background stuff as transparent to a developer and by extension to a user as possible. So yes, what does CRIS stand for? I always get asked that. It used to mean the children's research integration system back in the day, but there's nothing children specific about this. And there's nothing even Boston Children's Hospital specific about this per se. So as many of these projects do, they become cool and then they become a recursive acronym. I'm not suggesting this project is cool, but you know we have the cool recursive acronym called CRIS. So I'm sure most people in this audience are quite familiar with these kind of pictures. I'll just pretty much quickly gloss through it. Um, back in the day, in the day still exists today, most research developers live over here with the on. They make a program which requires data, and all of this stuff has to be managed by a user of their system, um, which results in so many good solutions not really going. So we've tried to shift over to this to this side over here with a platform as a service. Letting an application researcher developer just focus on their applications and the data that they want to get. We tried to make all of this as hidden from them and end users as possible. So let's take a quick detour and, and just um, talk a little bit about what do real world medical clinical apps look like in 2020, right? So I've gone and I've taken some screenshots with suitably um, you know, blacked out any kind of PHI, just to show you what things look like today in the real world at a place like Boston. So you be the judge, um, and you know I'm going to give some spoilers. I don't think they look great by any stretch. So here's an example of a typical app. This is a actual scheduling app that is used to uh, schedule patients um, to a particular device, like a scan or whatever they want to do, and collect information about them. Um, if you look at this just from a UI perspective, this is a production app that is sort of web-ish based, but it harkens back, in my opinion, at least 20 years in everything about it, in its, in its ideas, in the horrible Windows 95-ish kind of buttons that are used, the, the horrible icons that are just difficult to see what's going on here. This is a production system. Um, here's another one. This is a kind of real-time-ish web-based monitoring system during the OR where um, feedback is given to um, uh, anesthetic being administered and various real-world parameters. Again, this is, this is something that a clinician or an anesthesiologist would look at um, to make decisions or monitor the, the um, patient. And I don't know about you, but I don't know if I would want to have my surgical procedure dependent upon reading this um, in real time. Um, here's a typical another example of, of apps that exist in the clinical system. Here we have information about a procedure um, which is quite which is quite detailed, but the entire approach here, despite the very bad design in my opinion, is that this is a completely read-only kind of interface. Um, read only as to the human user looking at it. There is no way that this service provides any kind of API or ability for you as an end user, developer or any end user, to actually get this information out of the system except as on the screen. You know, I have seen people, this over here, this, this quote unquote table, is inaccessible from any, from any other application. It just lives and exists only in this display, in this app. These kind of graphs. Again, I have seen um, clinicians actually make a screenshot of these things, PDF it, and push that back into a clinical database simply because this system offers no way for you to just get these graphs or this information out. Um, here is a typical. Um, uh, it's called Synapse. It is what you use is used to look at images um, as they're acquired or once they've been acquired. And again, just from a user design perspective, there's so much here that, that is me the heebie-jeebies, not least of which, what is the point in a web app of having this weird gutter of stuff over here in this kind of workflow? Again, this is a web app really constrained and pushed bend over backwards to make it look like some kind of Windows desktop app. 2020. Okay, so to be fair, right, you know, I don't want to pick too much on, on what things look like in the real world. Um, clinical service is very conservative by design, right? Things change very, very slowly, and they have to be proven to work. 
you know, and, and we can't really point fingers, at least I can't, from the perspective of my next developer, because, you know, our typical apps in 2020, if my screen share will work, you know, look something like, you know, uh, I don't know if you can see my command line, but a command line thing like this, right? That will get an error message if you don't run it properly and will be confusing to an end user. But the command line environment over here is where most of the really cutting edge um, applications that do kind of useful things with medical data. So there's a huge disconnect between this world and the world back here. Right, so, oops. So what was CRITS? CRITS was created to address this basic need in the general sense of running some kind of analysis on some kind of unstructured data, quote unquote anywhere. Now, of course, given its, its origins, a lot of this compute is focused on medical type stuff. But there's nothing, again, on a platform that cares about what the data means. The semantics are unimportant. Um, the platform just strives to perform some kind of analysis on some kind of data and manage that for both users and developers. And hopefully using a more modern based, modern web-based interface. Just some quick history. So it's been around for, uh, for a while. Um, we started working on this in the early 2000s with some you know, basic bash shell scripts that tried to handle many of these aspects. Um, in the sort of you know, late 2000s, early 2010s, um, we had a very prototype WWT web toolkit uh, version. Um, in the mid 2010s, we rewrote everything in PHP shell JavaScript, which is our current kind of deployed system, um, which is now very much showing its age. And the late 2010s, we've redesigned now, which we call CRISP version three, which is using Python, REST, uh, Docker containers, a much nicer interface. Um, and this is the current version I'm talking about. So our involvement with Red Hat um, grew kind of naturally and serendipitously out of the Boston Innovation Labs around 2017 in conjunction with the Massachusetts Open Cloud and Boston University. And the, it was a natural synergy. We were trying to expand Chris as it was growing to the cloud. Um, BU was the academic host of the Mass Open Cloud and Red Hat was a partner in that entire endeavor. So quite naturally, we all sort of came to and the Red Hat component uh, has focused a lot about having parts of Chris be able to speak to OpenShift. And I'll give a bit of an overview about that architecture in a moment. And also by extension, deploying Chris or these parts to the mass open cloud. So the idea is that you can run these, um, you write an app, you make it Chris compatible, and for quote unquote free, um, as a user or as a developer, you can deploy it anywhere where it has, a, where it's able to run. So you can run these things with the mass open cloud um, without any extra work from your side. Uh, we had some hackathons in 2018 and 2019. Um, 2020 has now been the underworld. So there's very little been happening on that front, um, but we're trying to build together this momentum around. And we've also got some new domains, um, a new collaboration also with Red Hat and the team out in Canada, which I think presented their stuff um, here at Community Central about a month ago called COVIDnet. Um, I'll do a quick touch base on that at the sort of the end of the talk, so you can see what that looks like. Um, but that's sort of the genesis of us all. So, you know, for whom do we create Chris? It was created both for non-technical end users. Um, you know, these are your kind of clinicians. These are also your life scientists who um, are very non-technical in many ways. Um, as a way to make complex computation not only easy to clinicians and other life science researchers, um, but also we wanted to make this easy, quote unquote, for computational developers and researchers so that we reduce the friction of them getting their apps out there to people who want to use it. They don't have to worry about the platform. You don't have to get to, into dependency hell. None of these things are there because we're all putting everything in Docker containers, running it put on the cloud, the key thing here is a Chris app um, can run and live quite happily outside of Chris. It is just a Docker. Thing. You can sit there and run it from your command line to your heart's content day in and day out, or you could use the same app and register it to a Chris instance, and then you get the, all the benefit of um, data management and this nice way of interface. 
So, you know, we're not the only game in town, of course. This idea of having kind of containerized computation and medical workflow, medical research workflow is not new. There are lots of solutions out there in various different um, shapes and forms and focusing all of them on slightly different things, right? And here are the open source competitors, um, which is great to see such a busy field because it is an active uh, research and development area. I'm not going to go into this detail over here, but I just want to point out that this, this is an idea that is used or thought about by many smart people around the world. The idea of how do we run medical compute somehow more easily. Um, all right, so the key idea of CRIS really is to try and manage a very simple thing. You have data which lives in an input directory. You have some app that consumes the data and produces output. That's kind of the whole thing right there. Um, the trick is that we make our apps um, sort of dockerized images, um, and we have a system that now tries to manage the input and output directories for that Docker image. Now, this pattern is, of course, repeatable. So what the CRISP platform does for you is we take that simple idea where uh, the sort of double uh, border here is data, and the single border is a function of the data. And we can chain these together into arbitrarily complex processing chains. Um, we can split them, we can merge them again together, although currently, full disclosure, the merging is a, is a work in progress. Um, but the key thing here, which is somewhat unique in this area, and still today, is that all of the compute are Docker containers. Um, and Solutions that try to chain together um, dockerized compute are quite few and far between at the moment. So this is one of the first ones that's trying to use this in this capacity. So I'm going to quickly shift gears and give a bit of a view of what Chris looks like, and I'm going to go through this sort of quickly. It's kind of like a text animated little thing here. But at the heart of Chris is something we call Q. This contains um, the, let's put a network boundary that gets a some kind of context, this lives inside some kind of network. And we have a client that lives on this side of the network which wants to speak to, to the internet of, of Chris. Right. So let's add some more components to Cube so we can see kind of what's going on. There's a REST entry point, there is Swift storage, and there's a internal Django database. And what happens is you as the client speak to the entry point and all this magic happens. So let's say we want to push some data from here um, into Chris. We load it on the client, and we push it along into the uh, API entry point. From there, it is stored into script storage, and Cube registers uh, this information inside its in, uh, Django database. Now we want to do something on this data. So we have a manager, and then components that live outside of that. I've added the Chris UI over here, as you can see. So this communication over here, by the way, can be anything, command line, some random um, application is written to conform to its REST entry point. But we do have an official UI, which I will demo in a few quick minutes. Anyway, so let's add another network boundary over there. And let's do the same kind of thing again. Now we speak to our REST entry point. Oh, and over the hills and far away, we're going to add two more components that live in the remote environment. Um, that's a data handler over here and a manager over there, like a process manager. And again, the point over here is that they can live on totally separate networks, and oftentimes. Um, now let's add what we call the Chris store, which is a, uh, as the name suggests, this kind of store where people can publish their funky, wonderful, amazing medical apps. Um, and we also let's throw in GitHub and Docker Hub to make the picture sort of complete. So what happens is um, you, as a developer over here, you make your amazing new uh, computational discovery. Um, and you put it, uh, so you're in GitHub, you do it in GitHub, you wire it up to Docker Hub so that whenever you make a change to your GitHub repo, your Docker Hub image updates. Right? You, can, you live over here. So back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And at one point, you're happy with it, and now you can publish to the Chris store. Now, from the Chris store, a representation exists, and we show users a nice interface, and they can vote on things, they can start things, they can download them. Um, but from there, the Chris store is connected to Cube, and Cube is able to 
take that available compute and know about it, which it stores inside its database. So now a user can come along, right, um, and say, I want to run this new amazing thing um, on this data. And what Chris or Cube will do is it will then begin to manage this process. So there's an internal manager that speaks to a component called PFCon. I know these names are quite undescriptive, and I apologize. Um, but PFCon basically coordinates um, data to the, um, the I.O. over there and the data manager. So what happens is here we are. We now we want to do something. So now we speak to our Chris UI, which goes into the entry point. All of these things begin to happen. And the UI shows the user data and compute. The user chooses one of these, which now the query to kicks, out, kicks into life. It goes to the Swift storage. It actually pulls the data from Swift storage and packs it out in the data handler. This could be on the mass open cloud. So the data now used to be over here, right? And now this is now copied out uh, on the mass open cloud for argument's sake. From there, the coordinator says, okay, data is ready. It tells the manager, all right, fire up your Docker and go for it. It will pull the Docker image if necessary, and it will just simply run that compute. And here we have the resulting output. And it's quite straightforward what happens next. The coordinator gets that signal that the computer is finished. It then tells the I.O. handler, OK, we're done. Zip up the results, which it does. And it pushes us back to the main queue. And from there, the data now goes back into Swift storage. So it is available locally within the cube uh, kind of ecosystem. And then from there, from the cube ecosystem, we're able to put in the Django database and show this Ta-da, at the end of it all, to the end user through the crystal. So um, I kind of went through that very quickly. I hope it wasn't too confusing. Uh, I wanted to kind of demonstrate the distributed nature of the project um, and just highlight the main components, uh, which we can get back to if anyone has questions. Um, all right, so let's say you want in, which everyone is welcome. We have a... Um, website up here called the Chris Project, which is still, on, the website itself is under active development, but it contains a lot of information that might be of use. Um, we have some stuff over here, including some very nice little marketing videos that were created, as well as importantly for me, the team, and I apologize to folks um, outside of Red Hat looking at this, or maybe, maybe even Red Hat, this is not complete, and it's languished a bit, and that's, are bad, and we will definitely get everyone else who has uh, integral to this on this website. It just hasn't happened for today's meeting. Um, but this is the this is a core team over here at Boston Children's, in addition to two other people who I who joined somewhat recently and I haven't put on yet. So my apologies to them. That is Arushi and Dennis Jang, who are not there. The Mass Open Cloud team, and then this was a con uh, original core Red Hat um, team that has been working on the project um, in some capacity since 2017. Um, and we have a lot of stuff here about how you can get started. Again, this is all, this documentation is documentation in process, process. you know, uh, slightly beware. But now, what they always say you should never do in that presentation, I just show a demo. Uh, I am going to throw caution to the wind and try and do a quick, show you a quick demo. And it's even embedded inside the presentation, so that's kind of cool. Anyway, um, so here is what it looks like a normal Chris UI when you first log into it. I'm going to log out, in, and what you do when you first log in is you have a kind of area here which we call feeds. Each of these feeds is one kind of processing workflow that sort of grew from one, one basic set of data and all the operations on that data in kind of a tree. Uh, fashion. So I'm going to just show you the workflow creating something new, um, and we'll see if it works or not, which is all holding my thumbs. But here we are going to create what we call a new feed. I'm going to just give it a name, quick analysis. Now, when we create a new workflow, we have a couple choices about how to grow our amazing computational tree. We can um, choose files that already exist inside Chris, inside its Swift storage. 
um, we can upload new files from our computer and just push them you know, from our local station into this into Chris. Or we can either do, do some, some combination of both. And then there's another option over here is that we can run a particular application that itself creates data for us. Um, so I'm going to choose uh, files on my local computer. And I'm going to choose the files. And here I have some already queued up. Let's see if they go through. I'm going to open them and submit. I get some kind of quick review. And now it's busy trying to create the new feed, which in this case means pushing those images, um, and those are brain images, by the way, from my local computer up into, into here. Um, so that just takes a minute or two. In the meantime, while that is going on, let me go over here to another UI that I have feed up. Um, oh, that one is actually empty as well. Apologies. All right, so in the meantime, we've done this, so let's close this. And here we have our new brand smacking new analysis we want to do. So let's take a look what the UI shows us. So first of all, we see this, this, uh, this view, um, and we see some operations that are currently busy happening in the background. These are the tail end stuff of our initial pro genesis, right? Now the tree is beginning to grow, and it's kind of stuff that's happening. Um, so while that is getting itself set up, let's go back here and look at one that's already been created for us. So here is one that started with that same um, zero copy. And what I'm going to do is whenever an operation is finished, a node is finished, we can, um, we can interrogate its internals over here in this browsing interface. So let's look at the data that is inside of it. And here we see inside that node are a whole bunch of images. Um, these are the images that I might have just pushed up from my local computer. And we can, you know, we can look at these over here in the comfort of our browser. These are medical DICOM format, which is not a typical image format, but our JavaScript viewer um, gives us quite some thumbnails. We can have a more immersive experience, right, of this um, all the way down to this level over here. Well, let's quickly know some of these images. And there we go. So now we have an interface over here where we can quickly scroll through our stack of images and see um, these acquired uh, sagittal uh, MP rage MRI images. Um, and now the idea is, of course, from this point, is you having acquired this image, you want to do something to it. So what you would typically do, and here's one that's most keyed up. Um, but I'm going to show you again. I can go here. I can add a new node. This is a computation I'm applying to it. Um, and now I can choose from a list of available plugins that this particular Chris knows about, knows about. So I'm going to choose one over here, which basically converts um, those uh, raw images into a 3D model of the brain. And here we have, so this particular application exists and has, of course, its own set of command line parameters, which the front end will expose to a user. And we can just add in what is relevant for this particular analysis over here. Um, something like this. I can key it up. I can check over here. This, by the way, is a, is a um, free kind of editor of entry box where I can actually go and type things myself if I don't want to do the drop downs, right? I could have them, all of these flags keyed up in a text editor and I just can copy paste them into here to speed a lot of things up. And now I can continue through, I get a quick review and I add. Now what's happening is we see our processing has, has split into two. This was the previous one that was attempted. And now we have a new one that is um, coming off that initial same uh, core root of the tree. And in this way, we can actually build our branched kind of computation um, on a, any kind of uh, analysis that we're doing. Um, and this one looks like it's going through. Let's give it a second. I also want to keep an eye on my time. Um, I am going to impatiently look back at the feed list to see if I have another one. Um, let us look at this one over here. So here, for argument's sake, we finished that analysis, which we did. Um, here's another one that's keyed up. And we should be able to interrogate their internals. Uh, but it looks like they might still be running. Right? Here. OK, so here, for argument's sake, 
is that free surfer run that has been completed. And here we can see we've built another chain of more compute down the line. Um, I can interrogate its data over here. And for argument's sake, let's take a quick look here just for happiness. Um, and here is an example where that initial um, MRI data was analyzed. And maybe this was a good one to choose, but let's see how quickly this goes. Um, and it was um, some process was applied in this particular case that those 2D slices were analyzed and a 3D representational model of the brain was constructed. Um, and this particular model also classified every single surface location as belonging to one of many number of different kind of issue types and classes. So it was both a reconstruction and a classification. Now, while I'm showing you this, um, and we'll see how long this loads, and I hope it doesn't take too long, these operations um, for someone outside of Chris, if you're living in the command line, are certainly quite doable, um, but they're extremely tedious to do and essentially will never be handled by a clinician. Um, no one is going to actually go through the effort of trying to run these workflows through a Linux command line. Um, this was a key thing we were trying to address with our system. How do we make this usable and doable for um, clinicians at the end of the day? So while that's keying up, I'm going to actually jump ahead and show you some of our interfaces that we're trying to do over here. Here is um, the Darwin AI, which is in collaboration with a group in Canada. Um, as a COVID-net initiative for which we have Red Hat volunteers currently um, jumping in and helping out in an amazing way. And the idea with this, so here we're seeing a UI that is actually looks quite different from the one we have over here. Um, but this is all the same back end. And this goes to the point where we tried to do a lot of design into um, having multiple UIs being supported by the same back end. Um, all right, so now that Ghosts of demo have actually struck because it looks like that one is spinning. Uh, I think I have one over here. All right. So you know, here is the is a is a UI experience that is tailored to a one particular workflow. And this workflow is a clinician or a doctor would come in and want to get a patient ID or for argument's sake over here. And here are some here are some data points. Here are some images that were collected for that patient, and they just want to know, do these images show evidence of COVID infection? And very quickly, let me just key one up, and I'm going to do an analyze. And now what we have thing over here is we see analysis being kicked off. And again, this UI experience is catered to this particular workflow. And now a bunch of processing steps are continuing. Now, um, what will happen when this is finished is we will get a prediction of whether this particular image, what, it's, what is the probability of it having a COVID infection based, of course, on the particular neural network that has been trained in this particular case over here. Now, what we can do as well is um, back. Oh, incidentally, we now have this one up. Let me just quickly see if that works. Oh. Okay, so I think I might have lost some context over here. But you would have, you should have seen the nice 3D model of the brain rotating in the screen, which is not happening, so I'm just going to X that out. Um, but these were the images that would have been rotating in that MRC viewer. But if I go back to my feeds, I think here, incidentally, this dirt copy we see over here is that COVID net analysis we have just kicked off. So here we go, it's going to its first step and trying to finish off the first step of its computing chain. And it's automatically scheduling a whole bunch of nodes down the line that are particular to this to this operation. Um, I think here is one that has been already being done and completed. So here's an example of that entire chain that has now been completed, where a a user, um, such as a clinician, knows nothing about what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, they just choose an input and let it process. Whereas the Chris system has now been keyed to understand how to chain these dockerized computes together to get to a final result. Um, and the final result in this particular case is a PDF, which I don't know, oh, I can't view it over here, but I can look at the, um, let me look at the COVID net output over here. The COVID net output produces a JSON file, which if I look at the JSON file, gives me the prediction that this particular image was 
probably pneumonia, given that it was 38% pneumonia and 37% COVID, that particular image. Um, this final pipeline over here is showing how we can take the output of this one and do some operation, which in this case is making a nice PDF report, which, yes, there we go. So here is a uh, nice PDF report based on that initial analysis workflow. All right, so what I'm going to do as we race towards the end of the top of the time is I'm going to show you some uh, mock-ups about what we're working with right now with some, um, and this is a shout out to Mo over at Red Hat, a UI um, ex but designer, about how can we better integrate things like hospital lookups inside this system. And um, it's extremely useful for a system like this to be very natively integrated into. And hospitals use something called a PACS, EACS, which I won't go into detail what that means, but all images at a hospital are stored in this kind of wonky database. And here is a mock-up um, of a UI attempt to bring that into the Chris ecosystem. So, a clinician would type in a patient ID over here. You can search on that and then you will get a result. These are some patients which you can further go back and search someone else. Um, or what we can do is we can now get a list of all the available studies for that patient over here. Um, we can now decide to add a particular image or a group of images to our library. Um, we can go over here or uh, add this one to our library, and now we'll be loading that image set so that Chris can do something with it. Um, or what we could do over here is um, modify this again. Oops, lost my context. Or what we can do is we can also look at an image and get a quick thumbnail and open it in the in the viewing experience, which I think um, locked. Oh, there we go. So now we've loaded that and we can open that in the, in the viewing experience, all inside this environment. And now if we're satisfied that this particular image is one we want to do something with, we can now um, pull this into the Chris UI um, and either sort of on the metal like create a new feed based off this, where we would create a new feed, we would say whatever we want to call it, I don't know, train. Um, and that particular image would now be available inside the Chris storage, which we can browse through the Swift storage in a tree fashion um, like this and find the image that we're looking for. And then pull it in and do some kind of analysis, drop an analysis on it. So that this is this is the more kind of down to the metal um, developer power user interface. But we can actually then go from find a workflow that works very well, we can um, construct a very um, tailored and custom and specific experience that only handles that one particular case, but handles it uh, well, or at least we would hope well. And I think I am, there we go. I am up at the end of my time. And with that, I say thank you very much and happy to answer any questions or talk about this or anything like that. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we, um, we really appreciate the presentation and the demo. We have questions um, from our audience, and, and if you haven't asked your question yet, be sure to get them in. We do have some time to get a few more questions in, if need be. Um, so Daniel asks, um, he had seen that you had an epic interface in your demo. Other than not being exceptionally cloud or web friendly, you know, how do EHR or EMR systems pose challenges that Chris will help to address? Um, that's a bit of an apple and oranges uh, kind of question is my first reaction to that. Um, in many ways, these EMR systems are not really geared to um, doing compute. Um, they're very much geared to organizing patient data, um, electronic medical records, by the way, for those who don't know what an EMR is, or EHR, um, electronic health record. Um, and the name kind of suggests their behavior. They are electronic interfaces, quote unquote, to records. And they are certainly based more on presenting those information or dealing with the kind of record-based information, like for scheduling, for getting information about a patient, this kind of stuff. But if you want to do something with an EMR, like 
get the information about a patient and then say, oh, now I want to analyze it with some kind of AI technique, they don't provide that kind of approach. So I would say they are certainly more data-based in some way, um, whereas a system like Chris is certainly more compute-based. So I hope that answers that. Okay, great. Thank you for the clarification. The next question comes from Zuhaib, um, who asks, you mentioned input process output, but what about integration? Say you need to pull some reference data or other type of data from other systems for processing. How is that accomplished? Okay, so we're kind of talking at two different levels here um, in some ways. So the my mention about, you know, Chris being an input process output manager or machine is, is kind of at its most basic level. So that is kind of transforming data from from one type to another when you analyze it. Integrating data is something that lives above that, right? And I would say the integration um, is really um, apparent when you chain a lot of these uh, processing things together. What I mean by that also is that you said how you need to pull some reference data or other type of data from other systems processing. Well, that still falls under this input process output regime, right? Because you are, the process that you are running over here is the, you know, the web request to your database to pull this data. The input to that process was the parameters that that web call needed to perform its function, and the output of that process was the data that it was getting. Now you have the data in Chris, now you can then apply the next chain of analysis down the line. So I hope that answers the question. Um, I think so. All right. And an another question from Daniel. In your opinion, does Swift object storage enable better security or an easier path to HIPAA compliance? And HIPAA, for those of you from not in the United States, is the U.S.'s Health Information Privacy Act. Um, so how would you answer that question? Um, yes, I would say, again, these are talking about things on two different levels. I, um, HIPAA is more about, is more a regulatory construct. And it is more about assigning um, associations of um, liability in some ways and protection. It's not necessarily a technical thing. HIPAA doesn't talk about a technical solution. It talks more about if I want to put my data somewhere off-site, I must have a signed agreement with that data storage provider um, in which they agree to do a certain bunch of things with the data, so protecting it and so encrypting it. And I, from my side, agree to do some kind of policy in terms of how I handle access, like you know, changing my password every few months. That's what HIPAA does. So using Swift, using something like this, they're not that's at a completely different level of this of this stack. So does Swift enable a better security? I, yes, it does if you set it up correctly. Does it uh, make an easier part of HIPAA compliance? It's not really part of HIPAA compliance because the data center that is hosting the Swift storage would be the one that has to sign and say, my technology is conformant. You know, as an aside, something like Dropbox or Google Drive, these storage solutions are, in many respects, more secure than what HIPAA requires. But can I go and save an image out on Dropbox? No. And that's not because it doesn't have enough security. It is because I don't have an agreement, a signed agreement with Dropbox specifically, where they the way they say, yes, we adhere to this and this. As an aside, sorry, I shouldn't become Dropbox. They do actually provide HIPAA, um, a HIPAA compliance service. But again, my point is that HIPAA compliance is more regulatory and the actual storage itself is more technical. So there are two different domains. Okay, good. Well, that, that clarification is definitely appreciated because there's, you know, so many issues running around uh, in this uh, particular yeah. sector. So those are all the questions from the audience. But before I let you go, I did want to kind of ask you another one, you know, like looking ahead into the near term, what are some of the things that you're excited about that are coming up with Project Chris that you're working on? Oh, um, you know, frankly, I'm super excited about the the collaboration and the sense of growing community um, around this around this project. Uh, certainly um, within the Boston kind of computational research community, but also in the larger Red Hat community, and you know, hopefully beyond that. Uh, you know, to me and the folks working on this, this is sort of near and dear to our hearts. 
the idea that we can actually make a working on computing stuff and actually make an impact um, in the real world in a in a good way is something that is is very satisfying. So I'm super excited about how things are coming together now and what is on the horizon very soon, which I've been saying this for way too long, but the system I just shown you is so close to being released. I, that is my biggest thing now, is get that really stable and out there. All right, good to know. Well, thank you so much again for a fascinating uh, presentation. Um, I certainly learned a lot about the progress of, of medical uh, applications and data sets, and I, uh, we all appreciate you coming on today. Great. Thank you very much. I love being here. Thank you. All right. And with that, uh, again, thanks to our guest, Dr. Rudolf, Rudolf Pinar um, from the Boston Children's Hospital talking about Project Chris. We will wrap up another edition of Community Central. Look for other uh, editions uh, coming up soon at communitycentral.tv. And we will be back with more insights into the open source communities that we all work with uh, coming soon. Thank you all very much and have a great and safe day.